coordinator for Oatana Public Schools. Uh, I've been with Oatana now about 25 years, but I've been a science and STEM teacher for about 33. This is year 33. And uh, this summer I had the opportunity to present at the uh, NSTA um, STEM forum. And we were supposed to be live in Louisville, Kentucky, but obviously we weren't. Uh, so I pre-recorded my session there. So when Carrie contacted me and said, would you share that presentation here? Uh, I have uploaded it. Um, and so in my session, in the session, you can see there's a link to my video channel. It's on Vimeo and I have created a video to explain how um, 3D learning works, engineering for elementary and middle school in particular works. Uh, but I've, I've taught this lesson at the high school level too. It works really well with physics, uh, especially general physics, not so much AP physics, um, but the AP physics kids have just as much fun. Um, and it's really a way to introduce um, what is engineering, how does engineering work, and how can we take um, pretty common items that we find around the store, you know, like these little vibration bugs and hack them and turn them into something useful that can actually do a job. And, you know, we think about uh, Zumba or Roombas. I have a Roomba here in my house. And that began with the same concept as these little nano bugs. So teaching kids how to hack everyday toys and, and uh, materials is one of those first steps into engineering. So if you want, you can uh, watch the video. Otherwise, I can play the video and then share my screen so you can watch it that way. But the, the quality is probably not as good. Robots and reading. Oh, these lessons are based on the five E's. Engage, explore, explain, elaborate, and evaluate. Five E model for teaching is outstanding. There's also great ideas in science and children. But teaching about how to use robots, that's something we're gonna talk about today. So my name is Tom Maher, and I'm the District STEM Education Coordinator for Owatonna Public Schools in Owatonna, Minnesota. And I wish I could be there with you today, um, talking about how we can teach science and engineering with elementary kiddos, uh, but you get me on video. So in the course of the next 30 minutes, uh, I'm gonna try to explain how science and engineering works, how we can bring that to um, our elementary students, and in particular, the ideas that STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEAM, if you're a STEAM school, the inclusion of arts, how each of those are actually subjects that we can easily tie together. And they are not a separate subject that now you have to fit into an already crowded and crazy day. Um, the nice thing is, is that with some of these ideas we're going to practice over the next 30 minutes, I hope that you find um, the engagement and the excitement of your kiddos to be as much as what we have seen here in Minnesota. And our STEM schools, particularly in Owatonna, Owatonna is located about 75 miles south of Minneapolis-St. Paul. It might appear to be a outstate or a rural school, but we're actually quite urban. Most of our families come from uh, manufacturing and agricultural work. Uh, we have a large population of East African and Somali students. We also have a large population of Hispanic students, uh, mostly in close relation with Texas. And we're along the, the Central I Interstate 35 pipeline in which seasonal workers and manufacturer workers follow uh, this change in agricultural and manufacturing work as it transitions from Minnesota to Texas. So many of our students are um, actually English second language learners, almost 20%. Uh, so when we find we're using STEM lessons, we find that students are actually getting the science and the technology or engineering language together because there is so much new vocabulary whenever we're working in STEM 
that regardless of whether you speak English or not speak English, we get to learn at the same time. And most importantly, is we learn through our actions, through our experiences, and through teamwork. So students are actually helping and encouraging others to learn along with each other much more than relying on us as teachers. So let's think about what STEM is for a little bit. STEM ideally is an acronym, which if we think about STEM as science period, technology period, engineering period, and M period, that would be four different subjects. It's enough to teach language arts and social studies and make sure they get to art and math. Um, but if we think about it more, of not science as a subject, but scientific thinking, technology use or creation, engineering design and problem solving, and mathematical thinking and analysis. We can use those skills, those learning skills, the way we look at our world in every subject, not just strictly those four. This is the way human beings have been learning since the Renaissance. The idea that STEM is not now what we have to teach, but it's how we teach. How do we teach kids to think scientifically, to make their own technology or to use the technology that we have available? How do we get them solving real world problems and engineering solutions and understanding if the solution worked or didn't work based on mathematical evidence? data collection and analysis. I can see kindergartners learning how to read graphs. We don't have to wait until they're in high school. We can start very young with this. And that's the exciting part about teaching with STEM. So when we look at the acronym, it's not so much individual, it's actually S plus T plus E plus M equals, I think, learning. So when we work through STEM teaching and learning, we want to keep the idea of Carol Dweck's work from Stanford University on growth mindsets. How do we teach students to see that they have the potential of yet? I don't get it yet. I don't understand how this works yet. If we add the words yet to the way we work with our students and to helping them learn, we build their efficacy, we build their endurance, and we build their grit. If we take this approach of STEM as pedagogy into our teaching, to ask questions scientifically of how we understand language arts or how do we understand art or how we understand math, then students learn those higher order thinking skills, those critical thinking skills that we've always wanted them to use. When we have them using more complex thinking, whether they're solving a problem or engineering a solution, we're actually building literacy and fluency as well. So in our school district, we emphasize the idea of STEM literacy, STEM fluency based on STEM experiences because of the complex language that's integral to being able to explain a scientific concept or to explain how a technology works or solves a problem, that requires the experience of actually being with those materials. And today, when we work with nanobots, uh, nano being small, bot meaning an automated machine, that language is actually essential once we have the experience, if we're engaged in the STEM experiences and the shared common experiences among students, then they are going to use the language to be able to talk to each other about what they are doing. It moves beyond simply memorizing key terms. Science, technology, engineering, math, or learning is not about simply vocabulary acquisition. It's about vocabulary, utilization. That's where fluency comes in. We want them reading, writing, and explaining via STEM. So we've designed a model that we use with our students um, and those three well-balanced STEM experiences, STEM literacy and STEM fluency are coupled within the, the 
learning activities in which students are doing STEM activities. They're talking about it. They are reading about it, especially with nonfiction text. They are writing about it. Uh, the use of journals, and I really emphasize the use of journals and handwriting, not just simply keyboarding. Uh, but then sharing what they've learned after they have completed a particular project or a particular problem solving. Communicating with others, sharing what they've learned either through technology, through art creation, verbal speaking, hits many of the standards in the Common Core and the NGSS that we used to teach separately but now can be part of an integrated, a fully integrated classroom and fully integrated lessons. So, I like to use the word STEMify. Um, we first coined that word uh, when we first started as STEM schools in 2012. It was how do we look at what we're teaching in such a way that we can integrate those four subjects into our language arts, into our social studies, into uh, our health, into uh, reading and writing. And so we coined this term of STEMify. This means how do we bring an interdisciplinary, inquiry-based, problem-solving way of teaching and learning. It begins with students having shared common experiences. We allow students to ask questions, we encourage them to ask questions, and we teach often through asking questions, almost Socratic in many regards. We teach students how to research their answers, and Google is great, but it is not the end-all and be-all of figuring out the answer to all things. So it's very important to teach students how to research, whether it is to conduct a scientific investigation or is it to do a um, engineering challenge and then test it against other iterations of machines or technologies that people have created. Having them work in teams where they have to talk to each other, they have to read each other's notes, they have to share information. Arguing from the evidence, from data, if students are using data and evaluation as part of understanding what works, what doesn't work, what has changed or hasn't changed, they're arguing about objective information instead of opinions that could breed conflict. So we actually teach students how to overcome conflict and work together because they're discussing objective information working together to form solutions, and then giving them the challenges through the investigations that apply directly to the real world in their own backyard, in their own classroom, in their homes, and in their neighborhoods. So we, they can see what's happening. For example, we could study erosion. And in Minnesota, we're the land of 10,000 lakes. Well, we also have many, many rivers and ponds. And erosion is happening everywhere. But textbooks often show pictures of the Grand Canyon. I taught in Arizona for several years, many years ago. I could take my students to go to the Grand Canyon to see the gorge and how the Colorado River has cut through the sandstone. Well, Minnesota kids don't have a real concept of the desert, but they do have a concept of the creek that's a 15 minute walk from the school. So with that in mind, how do we make those real world connections? Adapting what might be in our curriculum or in our textbooks to what is in our students' lives. The three dimensions of curriculum. In science curriculum, the NGSS, we have science and engineering principles. Then we have cross-cutting concepts. And then we have disciplinary core ideas whether it's in chemistry, physics, earth science, or biology. Those are the disciplines, and they have specific information and core ideas that need to be taught. But cross-cutting concepts aren't necessarily science or engineering only. When we look at the cross-cutting concepts, we'll find that they cross, and by crossing into other areas, we can use them when teaching language arts or social studies or engineering or science or math, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if we look, break down the science and engineering practices, they are broken down into eight main 
practices or skills that we think students need to learn in complexity, uh, increasing complexity over time. Asking questions or defining a problem. If you're gonna ask a question, that's more scientific. If you're gonna define a problem, that's more engineering. Develop and use a model. So in the activity that we're gonna be doing here today, the idea of using a micro robot as a model for something a little bigger, like my Roomba. But I have to plan out and then carry out an investigation. I have to determine what worked and what didn't work by collecting data. We live in a world where we are just infused with data all over. How do we measure and record accurate observations? So that way we have information that we can argue from a little bit later because we want to explain what worked, what didn't work, what changed, what didn't change. Then if we can interpret factual information and discuss that, it is not about differences of opinion, it's about different interpretations of the same information. Measuring Speak boulders about kindergarten it, style, fluency. I love it. So the cross-cutting concepts are essential because this is where we think about like Bloom's taxonomy. The Bloom's taxonomy and hierarchical thinking, we actually can use to cross content areas. One of the biggest cross-cutting concepts of cause and effect, cause and effect, whether we're talking about character and plot, or we're talking about a ball rolling down a ramp, or we're talking about how uh, temperature can influence whether we get rain or whether we get snow. There's cause and effect here. Cause and effect also follows patterns. We as human beings have an innate ability to see patterns. We see patterns all over and we look for them. We listen for patterns in music. We can tell, even if we're unmusical, we can tell when something is off key. It just doesn't sound right, which means that mathematically, it doesn't follow either an octave or it doesn't follow the rhythm of the beat. And we can tell that break in the pattern. Everything has structure and function. In biology, this is in very important, but mechanically, structure and function can also be extremely important, but machines work together as part of a system. How do we get a pencil? It has to be manufactured. When we start looking at the main components of these within our disciplinary core ideas, you'll find that you can teach engineering with just about any grade level about any subject. So let's keep in mind some of the, the key components of engineering, for example that with engineering, there are multiple solutions. There's no one right or wrong answer. And we have to be open to the idea that engineering identifies phenomena. And this is a big concept and shift in teaching. And how do we teach students to recognize phenomena in the world around us and to build a story that teaches students how to explore phenomena and then use technology to influence or change that phenomenon. So, a challenge. How can I clean my desk with something similar to a Roomba? Roombas work great on the floor, but I don't know how well they would do on my desk. a little bit. It made me think about what could I create that would be smaller than a Roomba. And I remembered hex bugs. Hex bugs are a small vibration motor robot that can move on just about any surface. Would there be a way for me to design this little robot? to be in such a way that it could clean up my desk. 
not necessarily vacuum up, but maybe it could sweep. That's where looking at the design process, building, constructing, testing, and then checking to see if it works comes in. So now we're gonna try an experiment. Or is it an engineering challenge? It's pretty tough to tell sometimes. I first need to understand how these move. Then, from my observations, I can ask the question, how can I improve it so it does a job that I want it to do? So let's take a look at this little hex bucket. There is a small switch underneath here. And when I turn it on, it vibrates and it moves around. And it bumps into things. It can move across my magazine. But I would say its movement is fairly random. So the challenge is, how could I use some simple materials that I could create sensors? on this bug so that way the sensors or the appendages could clean things up on my desk now part of the design process is i first need to draw what i'm looking at so if i'm thinking about my nanobot design i like to use notebooks with graph paper because now i can draw it to scale some of your students might struggle and they might want to say, okay, can I just trace it? You bet. If you want to just trace your nanobot, go right ahead. But the important part of writing a diagram and creating one is we're going to have to, you know, that doesn't really match, does it? We're going to have to label parts. So I'm going to add this top part. And then it has one, two, three, four, five, six legs on each side. So does that make it an insect? I'll let you think about that one. So I need to make sure that I label these as legs. Here is the back. Here is the body. And this kind of juts out a little bit. I'll say this is the head. Now I'm teaching scientific drawing, technical drawing. And if I don't know what to call these, I could actually make these up. So here are my vocabulary and design. Very similar on if I'm going to teach students how to design or observe insects. We do the same thing here. The challenge is what everyday objects I could use in order to modify my nanobot. What do I get to use? Look around. <clears throat> we have post-it notes. So each student could have one post-it note. You will need tape, but we need to limit how much tape is available. So I say 10 centimeters. 10 centimeters is about one finger length. And I happen to have a ruler here. And that's nine and a half centimeters that I just pulled is that piece off. So about one finger length is approximately 10 centimeters. Twist ties. Twist ties are wonderful to use because twist ties can be easily shaped and manipulated and you get two twist ties and two paper clips. Paper clips are stiffer and many students don't think about how you can unwrap these. They often don't think about a paper clip as raw material, something that they can change. They'll often use them just as they are. But a paper clip was an ingenious design from the 1890s figure out how to hold papers together works great but if we take it apart now we have a piece of wire that we can design into many other things and a rubber band very low tech 
With these materials, now I can build sensors, feelers or antennas, or I could build appendages, arms, legs, wings, something that's going to allow my uh, nanobot, my small robot, to clean up my desk. So let's say I was doing some bead work. And now I have beads all over my desk and I need them cleaned up. Let's see what we can design. Coming back to my diagram, my design is going to be like, well, I'm from Minnesota. So we are going to design a snow plow because that seems to be most of the year. So if, I'm gonna draw my nanobot from the top now. So it has sort of a hexagonal body and this little ridge part. And then points on its backside. Kind of shaped like that. So I'm going to use a rubber band here rubber band there and I'm going to use this to hold a um, some feelers out and then I'm going to use my twist ties and I'm going to tie my twist ties around the back and then point out this way and these are going to use to stabilize From here, I'm going to add a paper plow. So my paper plow is going to be shaped this way. So I need one paper clip, a rubber band, and two twist ties to stabilize. Let's see what I can build. to test. Let's turn it on and let's see if this little guy is going to clean my desk. Yeah, pretty good. I missed a few over there. Well, I think it worked. It seemed like my bead plow did a nice job at cleaning off my desk and hopefully sent the beads down to the floor so my Roomba could sweep them up. It'd almost be better if it could figure out how to put all the beads into a particular area. But my first try actually kind of worked. The next step would be redesigning. Could I make the plow maybe a little better? Could I make the plow at an angle? Maybe it needs to be larger. Maybe it needs to be more scoop shaped. Maybe I don't need to scoop at all. Maybe I just need to catch them. How do I build those things? That's where coming back to my design and redesigning and building is another iteration. I could count how many beads. If it collected two, four, six, eight, no, nine, ten beads, is that efficient? I could actually figure out percents. So if I have one student who collected nine beads, another co student collected four beads, you have 90% cleaning out of 10 compared to 40% cleaning out of 10. Now we can talk whether one's more effective than the other. Exciting. Now, next advanced challenge. In Japan, something that students love to do people love to do is they actually like to raise insects and there is one insect called the kuboromushi which is the rhinoceros beetle they grow about this big they have big horns up front is that they have competitions of 
having these beetles push each other out of a ring. They don't kill each other, they just push each other around. Kind of like the national sport of Japan, which is sumo. So, can I redesign this to not only push away beads on my desk, can I redesign this to push another nanobot out of a ring? Hmm. This will be fun. Now we'll see who wins. The snow palau or the kabuto mushi, the rhinoceros beetle. Let's turn on their motors. We'll put the two equally distant from each other and let's see what happens. Nope, they missed. Let's try it again. Nope, no plow one. Let's try best two out of three. Ready, go. Oh, and a nice flip, and a nice flip by Kabuto Mushi. So now it is, all right. And now for the championship. Best two out of three. Let's see if Snowplow or Kabuto Mushi wins. Let's see what happens, who goes out of the ring first, and go. Oh, and the Snowplow drives Kabuto Mushi out, and it's gonna push him like almost right off the desk. So, so to wrap up, one thing is the analysis afterwards, to be able to discuss with your students, what did they learn? What did they see? I'd like to use what are called ORID questions, objective, reflective, interpretive, and decisional questioning, and to walk them through, what did you see? What did your nanobot do? How did it work? What was effective? What wasn't effective? Taking the time for students to stop and to write what they observe is essential. We can build our, our timed writing into directly our experiences with our nanobots. What do you do to improve your design? What steps are needed to increase its speed, to increase the number of particles it could clean up, how it can unlock from holding on to another nanobot? Those would be reflective questions. Getting them to think, how did they feel when they saw their nanobot win? Or how did they feel when they saw their nanobot get pushed out of the ring? What could you do with this in real life? Could you design a desk cleaner? Could you design something that keeps bugs out of your house without having to use toxins? Most of all, you will see the joy, the excitement, and the engagement of doing some serious robotic engineering. The, the robotic teams that students get involved with in junior high and high school, their challenges are very similar, whether it's battle bots or cleaning the environment or climbing to the top of a tower. It begins here. We don't have to necessarily build robots that appear to be human. Human beings are some of the most complex living organisms on Earth. Start simple. Start with the bugs. Bugs don't have a whole lot. We teach about insects and their body parts. Maybe students can use those that they studied as models for new inventions that they can come up with. 
that'll help make our world a better place. I'll take questions. glad you enjoyed it yeah. one thing i i like yeah. to remind people is the the nanobots themselves we actually received um from target i i walked into target and said this is an engineering lesson i'd like to do and they sponsored us and uh paid for 10 of them for a class set right mm -hmm. off the bat and i like the, strate the strategies that you use the way you you need to think you make the students thinking Mm -hmm. usually the students don't want to participate. They don't want to um, to say the ideas that they have in mind. Yes. But once they see something like that, their minds are open. Mm -hmm. you know? they, they are so open that they can continue giving some more ideas and they can try to do themselves what you were doing today, what you were showing us today. Yes. Yes. So, and that, that main idea, I really like it. I think it will help our students to be better in oh, what good. they do and what they thinking. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It was a very good class. I really enjoyed it. Oh, good. Good. Well, please be, be happy to use any of the handouts. I've got the handouts right there. If you want to print them out or use them with your own students, uh, feel free. And there's lots of ways to expand it. You know, I just wanted to give uh, sort of an introduction. I've seen people adapt it and modify it to what they're teaching in their classroom. Joe, did you have a question? Well, you know, when I was watching the video and, and you were talking about journaling and stuff, now I'm thinking about, you know, first and second graders journaling and they can really do it pictorially a lot better than mm -hmm. they would, you know, writing out their ideas, but it's a great way for them to start thinking about design and how things are put together and then creating just a storyline with it as well. And yes. so it's, um, I think it's, you know, and then using the graph paper uh, is a real good point to bring up that mm -hmm. it, it just, it offers a lot of different values or positive things that you can do if you have the graph paper versus just regular ruled paper. So uh, I like that that quite a bit. Oh, good, good. Yeah, I've I've used graph paper for many years with my students of all different ages, and to be able to draw to scale, to trace to scale, um, and then for kids to to relax and realize, oh, I don't have to follow the lines. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yep. just reducing that stress increases performance in students. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, and just the use of the robots and, and drawing, drawing the use of uh, the environment around you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what's mm -hmm. in the classroom can you use or something like that? And I'm a firm believer of that as well as, you know, you know it's kind of MacGyvering, but what <laughs> What can you take that you have with you right there and there right. and try to use it to perform a task you, that you want, right? Exactly. So not necessarily like in your case, you know, a lot with the robots and twist ties and that, you may give them those specifics or you ask them what else in this classroom would be suitable for that, right? Precisely. And that gets that whole idea of, recognizing an issue or problem and then coming up with a designer solution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some, some people are saying, oh, not only can we do competition or cleaning, but we can turn these into cat toys or, you know, dog toys and things. Just be careful. Dogs will chew them up, but cats will chase them. And, <laughs> and I thought that's a very creative idea. And yeah. children can, can, their imagination can really take off uh, when they start seeing the potential, you know, it gets back to, I don't know about if you have children, but, 
I swear, my children loved the boxes more than the toys at every birthday and holiday. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, well, I I got daycare kids here now. My my girls are all grown up, but mm -hmm. uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, the children are so creative and yes, uh, come up and and my wife is a firm believer in play, just free play versus a daycare center that tends to have them compartment, compartmentalized. And she says, well, why can't you have a boy in a dress working, you know, playing with the dump truck? <laughs> There's no reason you can't. That's right. right. Let, let them explore it, right? And, yep. Um, and so what we can do is provide the, the challenge or the opportunity of your idea and then let them take off with it. Right. Yep. You just kind of be the initiator and then yes. let, let it go where it was. And have you had times like when you, you know, you, you have this plan and we're going to make a certain type of robot. Mm -hmm. I think you realize just as they start get going, the kids kind of want to gravitate towards a different oh, robot. Oh, yes. And you just yes. say, okay, let's make that one. <laughs> exactly. And often they'll come up with a new idea as to how to use them. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, I might have an idea saying, okay, we're going to like pick up little blocks. And they might say, you know something, I, I, I really want them to be able to move bigger objects or how mm -hmm. can we get them to work in unison? And then I, I, I've always believed that when kids have an, an extension that they want to follow it's my role as a guide to to go with them and keep them you know still within the constraints of uh what it is i want them to learn but you know if they find something that's more engaging and they can apply the same principles of engineering to it let's go yeah, yeah i saw i saw something similar i was in doing some professional development in japan uh, about a year and a half ago and uh, they invited me to see their middle school robotics competition. And the kids had to design a robot that could climb a pole. It's like, but it was, the idea was how do we get, um, you know, rescue services to people in buildings or trapped in some place due to earthquakes and climbing a pole was one of the objectives. And you know, the different things the kids came up with and how to make like a remote control car grab a hold of a pole and then spiral its way upwards was just amazing. Yeah. So, all right. Well, um, we're a little bit past time. If you ever have any questions or any other ideas uh, that you'd like to run past me, I think my email is available in the program. Otherwise, just Google Tom Maher at Oatana Public Schools and shoot me an email. I'd be happy to help you any way I can, because the more we can get kids doing STEM, I think the more the more exciting learning that we're going to have. So, Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Right. Thanks, everyone, for joining tonight. Appreciate it. Thank All you, right. guys. Good night. Good night. Fill out the form, right? <laughs>